In this podcast, we discuss the wise traditions of our ancestors, the Western A. Price diet, and other ancestral techniques for living a long and healthy life. Welcome to Anti-Aging Hacks. On this podcast, I interview top experts in anti-aging and longevity, and we discuss the best natural and medical solutions to bring you practical advice you can apply right now to fight back against aging. We also discuss sneak peeks at some huge scientific advancements coming in the near future that will allow us to age backwards. I am your host, Faraz Khan. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Our guest today is Hilda Labrador Gore, also known as Holistic Hilda. She's the host of the Wise Traditions podcast, which is associated with the Weston A. Price Foundation. Each week, she interviews guests from a variety of backgrounds to dig deeper into what it means to pursue good health. Hilda, welcome to the Anti Aging Hacks podcast. Thank you for having me, for us. For our listeners, I want to start by asking who you are and what is your background in health and wellness. Oh my gosh, I hardly know where to start because I kind of got into this in my early 20s, if not earlier than that. Basically, I was born with a hole in my heart. I was born with a birth defect. Wow. And yeah, exactly. It was a wow because the doctor said if they didn't perform open heart surgery on me, I would die in my early 20s. So when I was nine years old, they cut me open and they sewed it up. And then they kind of let me loose and said, you can do whatever you want. And so I thought, gosh, what do I want to do? Well, I want to take care of this body. You know, so I always had kind of a healthy respect for my body. And what I did at first was I was just a fitness professional. I was like, okay, I'm going to work out all the time and I'm going to get certified by the American Council on Exercise. And I did all that. And that was great. But then I realized there was more to the puzzle. That's crazy for a young child, nine years old, to have open heart surgery. Did that make you a more careful child and your, were your parents always badgering you not to do things that other kids were doing? That's such a good question for us. No one's ever asked me that before. And the truth is, yes, I was a little bit hesitant. You know, I um, remember when it was time to play kickball, I'd be one of the last ones picked. And I didn't blame anybody because I was scared to run too fast or to go too hard. I didn't know what it would do to my heart because they were monitoring my heart and looking at the hole and seeing if it was going to get too big. So there was a sense of, yes, be careful. And so I, you know, when I was at the amusement park, I wouldn't always get on rides. It said, if you're a heart patient, don't get on. I thought, well, I guess that's me. You know, I, I didn't really know. Um, so then when I was set free after that surgery, I wanted to do everything and anything, and, but especially take care of my body and strengthen it. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I want to help other people do the same. Awesome. I love, I've played competitive kickball for years and soccer as well, but I just love that sport. It's so cool. Now, let me ask you this. How are they monitoring your heart after the surgery? It was more beforehand, before they sewed it up. After that, I would go back about once a year to the National Institute of health, because that was the group that performed the surgery on me, and they would just make sure everything was copacetic, you know, that all my, you know, blood work and everything looked normal, and the heart, of course, they would do ultrasounds and this and that, so um, after that stage, and like a year afterwards, I was able to do whatever I wanted, that's like I said, when I got my kind of life's calling. And so you work with the Weston A. Price Foundation. First of all, what is the Weiss Traditions Diet, and how did it come about? Oh, that's a great question. So um, let me just back up a little bit and say, as I was mentioning, I was all about exercise and didn't give really much thought to eating except, yeah, I knew I wanted to stay away from sugary desserts, but I didn't really think about it, nor did I think about advising anyone in any particular direction as far as eating goes, except not to overeat, right? Um, but then a dear, dear friend of mine became sick with chronic fatigue, and that's that condition that doesn't have an easy answer. The doctors didn't know how to help her. And so she started tweaking her diet to try to improve her health herself. And she met Sally Fallon Morell, the head of the Weston Price Foundation at a health fair. And Sally had a book called Nourishing Traditions. And in this book, I hope I'm not making this too, too long, but basically in this book, it showed how there were dietary principles in common around the world that we could 
enjoy wherever we live that would improve our health. So my friend, Lisa, started to eat kind of this wise traditions way, and she saw her health improve. Now, her condition was actually quite severe, and so it's taken some more work, you know, um, because she has heavy metal toxicity and all these other factors. But the point is, she started kind of whispering in my ear for us, like, hey, this kind of matters, you know, and hey, you need to think about what you guys are eating. And of course, I thought that meant, well, just stick with low fat or avoid, you know, too much meat or, (laughs) but I come to find out wise traditions, really wise Mm -hmm. traditions means eating the way our ancestors did. And what Mm -hmm. did they eat? They ate unprocessed, you know, no denatured foods. It was all food that was very real and and close to home and according to what was available and in season. Who did the research to discover the actual diet? I have to say this is all based on the findings of Dr. Weston A. Price. So he was a dentist researcher in the 1930s who basically traveled the world to find the healthiest people groups because he would get the National Geographic magazine and see these beautiful people with their wide faces and bright smiles and their energy and fertility. And he was like, I want to see if these people really exist. And if they do, I want to know what they're eating. Um, Mm -hmm. So he really, he went everywhere. He went to Alaska and Switzerland and Kenya and just all over the place, which wasn't easy in the 1930s. And what he found out was exactly what I'm telling you, that the people who were the healthiest were those eating their traditional foods and following their ancestral health practices. And so, and then he was able to compare these as a scientist, really, with those who had started to change their food and eat the more westernized food, what he calls the displacing foods of modern commerce. So people were having refined sugar and flour and oils. And these people, you could see a marked difference, even in just the photos he took. Their health was compromised. Their posture was you know, hinder their eyesight, their vision, their, they would have crowding of the teeth and uh, cavities. So there was quite this contrast. So the Wise Traditions Diet was established to lift up wise traditions for good health. It's so interesting. And I could imagine in the 1930s, we didn't have the technology or the blood or the biomarkers to get really in detail. So he had to look at external ad- externalities such as cavities or the crowding of the teeth or the way the posture was. It was very interesting. I didn't expect that. It is interesting. And he also noted behavior issues because what really got him going on this world tour was he was a dentist in Ohio, originally from Canada, but he was living in Ohio and all these kids were coming into his clinic and he's like, what's happening? Like their teeth were crowded, but not just that, their behavior was poor. They were having health issues. And so he was like, oh my gosh, The teeth tell the tale. So this Mm. became a little phrase for him where the teeth would be a demonstration of something happening on the inside. So then when he came home from his trip for us, he thought, I'm going to do an experiment. And he started feeding the kids at this one school one nourishing meal a day. He couldn't change everything about their lifestyle or their diet at home. But he started giving them this like hearty beef stew with bone broth and you know, probably pate and, you know, all the things he had seen, sourdough bread and a lot of butter and cod liver oil. With that one meal a day, the kid's health and behavior started to improve. So again, you're right. He didn't have all those biomarkers that are available to us today or the technology to really do a deep analysis, but he did what he could and he established a great foundation for us to move forward with our health today by looking back. That's awesome. And given that he was a dentist, he was obviously looking at cavities and crowding of teeth and everything inside the mouth. So that makes sense. Let's jump into the dietary guidelines of the wise traditions way of eating. Let's, if you would, Hilda, just elaborate a little more on the types of foods, the types of fats, what's good about fats and all of that. Sure, absolutely. So just imagine this, you know, (laughs) Dr. Price and his wife, I'm just picturing them super bundled up in Alaska literally talking to Inuits, the Eskimo people there, and they're eating whale blubber and fish. You know, it was a very seafood heavy diet, you know, and fermented fish, which they would toss into a hole and let sit there for days. And then later they would eat it. And that's actually a funny story in and of itself. They started eating fermented fish because they saw that their sled dogs would do better energetically, you know, when they ate 
the fish that had been sitting rotting, <laughs> supposed to be wow. rotting. I know. So they were like, maybe we should have that too. Like, again, these wise traditions, you know, come from somewhere. So anyway, so he's in Alaska. They're freezing. Then they go to Kenya. And the people there are quite different. And the diet is quite different. They're eating, you know, meat from the goat and cows and drinking raw milk and even drinking blood from these animals. And so there's the contrast. And then, you know, they go to Switzerland. It's all dairy products. You know, it's butter and cheese and bread. And So he came home and he actually brought samples of their diet home and he really did some studies. So this is what he found out. They had things in common. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, there were no refined or denatured foods. So the people that were healthiest didn't have the packaged and processed foods or what he called the displacing foods of modern commerce. They were eating the real food from their area. So that's that's number one. Um, number two, to his surprise, they all had some sort of animal products in their diet. Even in his time for us, he thought, well, maybe I'll find vegetarian people or people who are primarily plant-based in their diet. He did not. And what he found was they all had fish or shellfish, you know, land and waterfowl, you know, all kinds of mammals and eggs, milk and milk products. But what was interesting is this. They ate the whole animal nose to tail. And this is where we sometimes might be missing the mark, right? We might just be like, oh, yeah, I'll have steak every day. Well, well, that's fine. But did you know that one little ounce of liver has so much more nutrient density than one ounce of steak? Um, that one ounce of steak might have, you know, the, the protein and the, a certain amount of fats and all that. And that's great. But you've got the liver that's got the B vitamins and, you know, the uh, – other nutrients that are super going to help us, like almost as a superfood, you know, we consider the organ meat super dense. And actually, these traditional peoples knew that, too. They, some of them would kill the animal and throw out the muscle meat, like the stuff wow. that we eat. And they would choose to eat the organ meat. And if you look at animals in the wild, they will do that, too. They'll go after the liver and the heart and the brain and the eyes. So, you know, we, we, we got some work to do in that regard. But be that as it may, um, they would prefer, like I said, the organ meats and the fats. Um, he also, Dr. Price noticed when he studied the diet content, the content of the food, which he analyzed in his lab, they had these indigenous peoples around the world that he found had four times the minerals and water soluble vitamins than the diet of America in his day, and 10 times the fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, and K. So what that means is, even though, let's say, they weren't as developed as the modern world in the U.S., let's say, they were eating a richer diet. And so I postulate, and I'll catch my breath after this. You can ask me more questions if you want. Sure, but sure. I postulate that in the U.S., we are overfed but undernourished. This is what's happening to us now. We're eating all this packaged processed foods. And because it says heart healthy on the outside or, you know, dare I say, paleo approved, you know, things like this, we think, oh, this is great. No GMOs. Awesome. Well, yes and no. Like that's somebody else's label on if it's healthy or not. You know what I mean? Like yes. we're better off eating the real foods and going after those that are the heavy hitters nutrient wise. And that way we'll be more satiated and our body will func function in an optimal way as opposed to eating all the things that say they're healthy and actually are giving us minimal nutrients. By the way, this is a little side note for the listener. <laughs> if you see like a package of cereal or bread that says fortified with these vitamins, don't eat it because they're just adding something in after they took some of the good stuff out. You know, that's like a little marketing ploy. What you want is the food that's already rich in vitamins naturally. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you 100%, Hilda. It's it's crazy when we go to the, the aisles in the shopping store, there's 20 or 30 ingredients and a lot of those are preservatives. Like, When did we start <laughs> eating so many preservatives? And to add to that, there's a lot of omega-6 canola and vegetable oils which are heated and they go rancid in some of these preservation methods and they're causing inflammation and overabundance of omega-6 in our diet. But, you know, going back to the wise traditions, growing up, my grandfather used to tell me that eat the organs and liver was a delicacy. And he would say, eat the brain, eat the organs, eat the eye. And, you know, the kids were like, yuck, yuck, no, no, we don't want to do that. 
I pushed back when I grew up a little bit. I said, well, the science doesn't support it, so I'm not going to eat it. You got to, I don't agree with these wives' tales and, you know, tales from wherever they've come from, from tradition. But now I find myself going back and saying, you were right. The science is proving some of this stuff. And I believe more. Please tell me more. I'm asking them more, uh, quote unquote, non-scientific data points so I can incorporate those into my lives. And the last thing I'll say is 70% of the world today lives by an ocean or lives by water. And that's where a lot of our societies formed and you know, before we had mass industrial food production. And so to your point, they were all eating what was available in the area, namely fish at least, and realizing that meat was harder to kill. But fish was right there and they lived by the water. So yeah, most of the populations in the world are not vegetarian. Two things I want to bring up since you were mentioning preservatives. That's number one. The fact is preservatives, their job is to keep the food intact, right? So a friend of mine told me once, when we try to eat those foods, the, the food is kind of fighting us because it's trying to stay together. So it limits how well the body can break down and make get the nutrients that are in the food. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's trying to preserve it the whole way along through your system, which is interesting. So that's something to think about. We don't want to get food that's going to fight digestion and are accessing the nutrient content. But number two, to your point about fish, Dr. Price found because he also was something of an anthropologist and when he could find skulls he would study the skulls and the thicker skulls which is a good thing the thicker skulls he found were among those who had a diet higher in seafood seafood is much more critical than i ever realized there's a lot of dha in seafood which is the, not only a it is the primary structural fatty acid in our brains in our eyes, and even the central nervous system. So it's really essential for brain development, and it makes up the majority of the fats in our brains. And I can't emphasize enough how important DHA is, which we get a lot from the fish. Well, just one more thing. There are actually like 11 principles of the Wise Traditions Diet that people can just find on the Weston Price website, because to go through point by point is a lot. But we've covered many, many of the main aspects. So one other point that I did want to mention, one other principle has to do with fat, that again, to Dr. Price's surprise, as he's studying these things and looking for what's in common, most other traditional diets had a much higher fat content. So fat is also critical for brain function. And I think we're starting to understand that more. Like I see a trend toward keto and even my paleo friends are all trying to get a little more fat in, which is fantastic because I think we're probably more high on protein in general when we're in these health and wellness spaces. You know, the people are like, give me more of that meat or, or fish or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but we forget about the fat and it's really, really critical as well. So um, we can't, I can't dictate to people how much fat they should personally take in. It probably depends on what their heritage is and, and what their body will tolerate. But I think we could all safely increase our fat and, and see an improvement in our health. What are some obvious deficiencies in our diet? Interestingly, a lot of us are deficient in vitamins A and D, and these come in spades in cod liver oil. And so Dr. Price, as I mentioned, gave it to those children. He recommended it as a food, um, as does the Weston Price Foundation. And there has been some controversy in recent years about it because there are different companies that produce it. Some do fermented cod liver oil, which just means they try to kind of boost the nutrient availability of the cod livers. and um, But in the end, to me, I will say, I'll speak for myself, holistic Hilda, um, it doesn't matter to me how people choose to take in that uh, cod liver oil if they if they choose to take it all. I mean, I do recommend it. I do take it myself. My family takes it. But if they feel like, oh, I don't know, well, then just eat more fish. Eat more fish liver if you could, you know, however you can get that vitamin A and D in you. But he definitely recommended it and the foundation does as well. And I say, go for it. If, you, if it works for you, some people think it doesn't agree with them, then don't. But it it is a food and not necessarily a supplement. Yeah. And the other item that you know, I looked at and I found very interesting is the legumes that are recommended in the diet. And obviously, the the paleo diet is not so hot on legumes. And I've been reading a lot of the Blue Zones work that Dan Buettner has done, where he's also gone and looked at these Blue Zone societies where people are living over the age of 100 regularly or in a much higher percentage than the rest of the world. And they're centenarians, if you will. 
and they eat a lot of legumes as well. Now, I know there's ways to ferment and soak some of these so the anti-nutrients are taken out of the food and into the water, which we can drain away. Any comment on that? Well, that's exactly right. Like I think in health circles, people either avoid legumes or grains or they'll just eat a lot of nuts <laughs> and they're missing this wise tradition that really does make the nutrients in those foods more available and the process of soaking or sprouting or fermenting the grains or legumes or nuts or seeds neutralizes the anti-nutrients in those Food. So it, it makes me sad when people think, oh, I can't handle grains, and they just leave them all together, not realizing, oh my gosh, there's a way you could actually enjoy bread or rice, you know. It also makes me sad when people eat nuts, you know, kind of ad infinitum. Well, they just keep eating them <laughs> without stopping because they think, oh, this is so healthy for me, not realizing that those anti nutrients can actually irritate the gut. And not only make it difficult to access the nutrients, as we've said several times, mm -hmm. but can poke holes in the gut as well. So they have to be really careful about how they consume this. But if we follow the wise traditions, we'll be okay. Yeah, that's great. I've started soaking my nuts as well, especially almonds, which I didn't realize mm -hmm. needed more soaking than others. So how did you start the podcast and how long have you been doing it, Hilda? That's a great question. So what happened was... I had the opportunity to represent the Weston A. Price Foundation in Kenya. Basically for us, this Maasai leader called us. They have cell phones even in the bush, <laughs> I mean, the remote, remote areas there in Kenya. So he called us and he said, please send someone over. We're all getting sick. He was like, I have diabetes. My wife has asthma. He had come across the literature of the foundation and saw that it was true, that his people the Maasai are very hale and hearty, and now their health is starting to get compromised as they've moved away from their traditional diet. So the foundation asked for two volunteers to go over to Oiti, uh, this small town near Matapato, not far from um, Tanzania. And so they sent me and a friend over there, and we gave presentations both to people in Nairobi and then people in this remote village. And I, I was just blown away by the experience because I went, yes, to teach and to talk about these principles, but I wasn't saying eat our way. I was see, saying eat your way, you know, which was an amazing message to bring. But then also when I was there, I met people that I thought, gosh, I want to learn more about, you know, what their traditions are and what they've learned along the way. And I met a Maasai elder who was so old, he didn't even know how old he was. Like he, he literally didn't know. We just all presumed he was over a hundred because he didn't even know. So I grabbed my phone. No kidding. I pushed the voice memo app and just started asking him questions through a translator and found out when he was a young man, he's like, we were all healthy. Nobody was sick. And if it started to rain, we would just play in the rain. And now they say, put on a sweater. He's like, but we just ran around. And he said, if we got a chill, we would drink milk from the cow. Like it was all, it was all so sensible and beautiful. It was an amazing conversation. So when I came back from that trip and also when I was over in Nairobi, I had the chance to be on the radio. So I was like, okay, I'm in on the radio in Nairobi. How, 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 why can't I do this back home? So I came back and I said to the foundation, you have this amazing information. We should have a podcast. I'll be happy to host and produce it. And they said, okay, um, which was kind of to my surprise because they're very ancestral groups. I, I didn't know if they would get into something so modern, but they did. And it's been a tremendous vehicle to convey this information. And again, we want to empower people to make their own decisions. And I think you're probably the same way. You put that information out for general consumption and people can be like, I like that. On this other hand, I'm not going to go with grains or whatever it is. And that's fine. So we're just putting it out there for people to consider. So I met you at the Paleo FX conference in Austin. I had heard your podcast before, and you were exactly who I pictured you to be, Hilda. Now, I'm, I'm wrong on that frequently, but not this time. And, and I will add that, at least at the Paleo conference where we met, the Weston A. Price diet is different from the Paleo diet. Can you cover on how these two are different from each other? Well, you know, in the early days of paleo, they were very much focused on lean meat. And we were like, uh-oh, that <laughs> even though we agree on a lot, right? We were like, oh, no, lean meat isn't good because you need that fat. You need that fat. Like, that's more important than the meat itself, as we were discussing. So that's one place we differ. Now, I understand a lot of paleo folks have moved away from that and are moving more toward 
good, healthy fats, which is awesome. But I think the only other place we differ really is the grains and the dairy. They try to avoid them altogether, which I think is sad because it tastes so good. I love cheese and milk. Okay, maybe it won't agree with everyone, but get this. People need to try it raw because there is a difference between raw and pasteurized dairy. Pasteurized dairy was originally you know, the brainchild of someone because they thought, okay, this milk is making people sick. I think it was actually still even in the 1930s, people were getting tuberculosis and they were saying, oh no, it's because this milk is, is tainted. So what we need to do is pasteurize it. In other words, get it to a high enough temperature that we kill all of the bacteria. Well, there are two problems with that. One, when you kill the bad bacteria, you also kill the good. So it turned into this more dead product with a lot less active beneficial enzymes. And two, they were like putting a Band-Aid on the problem instead of going to the root cause. In other words, the reason the milk was tainted is because cattle were in cities in poor conditions, so they weren't sanitary. They're standing in their feces. Do you see what I mean? And so then their teats would get the feces on them, and then it would all contaminate the milk. And so what they should have done is said, hey, we need to move these cattle back to land where they can graze, and then we'll be okay. So um, we recommend raw dairy in a big way because Talk about A, D, and K, like Gouda cheese um, and active enzymes. People are always looking for probiotics these days. They love to pop pills. Well, we're saying no, like eat your fermented foods. That's another thing these traditional people had in common. Eat your fermented foods. Eat your cheese. Drink your milk. Like it's just a beautiful thing. I would really say the Wise Traditions Diet has pretty much everything on the table. So that that's the only thing that. I'm not a fan of in terms of the paleo diet. And again, it looks different for everyone, but I don't want to restrict myself. I want to enjoy all that I can, you know, and, and I'm able to, if it's all properly pre prepared and in keeping with wise traditions. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Now, Hilda, as you may know, the goal for the listeners of this podcast is to fight the decline that comes with aging and be biologically younger than your chronological years. Basically, Live your best life until it's time for you to go. And in particular, you look pretty young and your energy is also great. Let's get into some of the anti-aging secrets of which you have a few. Please tell our listeners how they can fight aging and be as youthful for as long as possible. That is really our goal. I agree with you 110%. I want everybody to live their best life and to feel 100% whatever age or stage they're at, right? So what's been so fun for me is I used to have high energy just because I kept moving. And honestly, I think some of it was nervous energy. <laughs> <laughs> but now my energy really comes from this deep well of strength I get from the Wise Traditions Diet, but then there's some other things as well, and these are really key. So you probably talk about this on your show, Faraz, but it doesn't hurt to mention it. One really big key for me is getting out in the sun. The sun actually gives our mitochondria energy. And these are the little tiny motor cells we have, tiny motors or engines we have in our cells. And so we, it's like we can feed in a different way. Yes, food gives our mitochondria energy as well. But two thirds of the energy our mitochondria get is actually from the sun. So we need to get out there and get it. And I'm afraid some of us, even in the health space, you know, we get up in the morning, we have a screen rise instead of a sunrise, we jump into our car, we go to the gym, we shower off, we go in the car to work, we come home at the end of the day, we want to just eat something good, okay, and then we watch TV. <laughs> and then it's, it's all artificial light. And that artificial light interferes with our melatonin, which isn't just what regulates our sleep or the hormone related to sleep, it actually oversees our mitochondrial function. This is fascinating stuff I've just started to get into recently, but it makes sense to me because it's also a wise tradition. Our ancestors were not inside most of the time, they were outside. So getting out in the sun, not only will give you energy literally, but it will actually power up the longevity telomeres. So those are the things that shorten as we age. <laughs> So you want to right, lengthen right. those babies. So getting out in the sun, and this is how I do it. I'll just tell everybody my secret. And I used to be a night owl. <laughs> but now what I do is I go to bed earlier. 
I get up and I try to get that sunrise sun within half an hour to 45 minutes of when the sun has risen because there aren't the strong UVA and UVB light at that time. We're not getting that. We're getting kind of a protective sunlight, which helps us when we get out in the sun later in the day, we're less likely to burn. So that's one thing. But the other thing is it really, like I said, it sets your circadian rhythm and it really energizes you. So to my surprise, I feel like I have more energy at 50 something, you know, than I did probably 20 years ago when I would burn the candle at both ends. Yeah, I used to stay up Mm -hmm. and I would always be like, man, I just have more energy than other people because here I am at 2 a.m. on my laptop. (laughs) What I didn't know for us is that the light from the laptop was confusing my body, telling my pineal gland it's the middle of the day. So no wonder I was alert. You know, when you get a second wind, it's not just because you're superhuman. It's because you're injecting it with the wrong kind of light. So I really think the sunlight is a critical piece. Plus, it's not just the food we eat. It's the interplay between the food and the light. So I also make an effort to eat outside. So if you go out with your friend at your lunch break, if you're listening to this right now and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm doomed. I work so hard. I never get outside. Fear not, because there are ways. Number one, you can have lunch outside with a friend. When you go to a pasta cafe, say, let's sit outside. Number two, you can take a sun break. If if smokers can step out for a quick drag, <laughs> you can step out for some sunshine, and it really will help you function better on all levels. So the sun is a huge one to me. And the other one, and this may be redundant for some of your listeners, but I just have to say it, is sleep. This is the one area, as I was mentioning earlier, I used to always shortchange myself on. And I didn't realize that it's kind of the time for your body and brain to take out the trash. So just picture if you don't let it kind of download the trash, you know, kind of restoring itself on a cellular level, your brain, your body, then you're more fatigued the next day. Obviously, you know that because you would feel like you're dragging. But It's really important to avoid brain fog and fatigue to let your body recharge. Just as we plug our phones in, when the battery gets low, we need to slow down and we need to sleep. And the best sleep is before midnight. And I'm saying this to those to whom I can relate who are night owls. I used to stay up till midnight or one. That was just what happened, you know. But now it's like, oh, my gosh, if you go to bed at 10 p.m., for example, those two hours before midnight, it's like twice as much sleep, for example. That's not scientific. But it, what I mean is the way I'm describing it is not scientific, but there have been studies on this. It is proven that you get deeper sleep, better sleep when you start earlier. So start earlier and then work on your projects for sure. And you will have time in the morning. I didn't realize that I could have that earlier time in the day. So sleep and sun are two key factors, which, by the way, yes, will improve not just your longevity, but your health span. In other words, how you enjoy those years. And I can also testify, I look better. There's a a reason that they have the beauty sleep thing that people talk about. You really do look better when you're well rested. (laughs) Thank you for sharing all of those, Hilda. And and we'll talk about some more. I just want to comment on uh, both of those that you brought up. Number one, sunlight, you're so right. It's the circadian rhythms these days are completely messed up because our ancestors didn't have all this influx of fake light at night to keep them up and keep them going. They slept with the rising and uh, the setting of the sun. So that's that's how their rhythms were. Now, you know, I was talking to Andrew Huberman, who's a researcher out in Stanford, and he's got a whole lab, and he's talking about how the eyes are an extension of the brain. And he recommended to me, it was about six months ago, is to not only wake up early, but get stare into the sun not stare but at least get your eyes to be in the sunlight and when i was a kid and i didn't know any better i was i think 11 or 12 years old i would stare at the sun on the way to school as my dad was driving us as a way of saying i have i'm strong i can stare at the sun and then somebody told me it's really bad so i stopped after a month or two Uh, but you know after talking to andrew i walk down either to get coffee or take a walk in the morning and I make sure that my eyes are pointing in a way that sun can enter even if I'm not trying to stare at the sun. That way, according to him, you get the circadian rhythm benefits that you should. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I totally do that. I did not mention that. It's Some people call it sun gazing now. But it's the opposite of what we've been told. We've been told, don't stare at the sun. But now I totally do because I read a book by John Ott called Health and Light. And in it, he talks about 
exactly what you're saying, that the benefits of receiving that sun directly through the receptors in our eyes to our brains, to our bodies is invaluable. It's like food. And there are actually people who who do it to the degree where they feel like they need to eat less because they're being nourished in that way. As I said, two thirds of our mitochondria energy comes from the sun. So that's a great word. I'm glad you brought that up. And then on sleep, are you using any devices to measure your sleep? Yeah, actually, I have an Oura ring. Uh huh. I've had my Oura for a few months. I want to say maybe six months, and I track it religiously. And I'm I'm obsessed with fixing my sleep right now. I'm working with a couple of doctors to one sleep on my back and get more REM and deep sleep, which I didn't know I was. I was such a light sleeper that I had challenges with both. So I'm working through those right now. But you're right. That's sleep is the number one anti aging hack, as you said. If you don't get your beauty sleep. None of the other stuff matters. There's a few key components that you have to get and knock out of the park before you start getting those 10 or 20% benefits on top of that. That's a big one for me, and I'm working on that myself. And then you talk about movement, Tilda, which is also so key. We're not moving. We sit at our desks or in the car, or we go to the gym and work out like robots in a very defined way in if we're doing bench press or if we're doing some of those weight machines. That was not how traditionally humans moved. We moved and we ran and we hunted and you know, we ran away from animals and sometimes we ran towards them and it was all kind of we carried wood, we foraged for berries and fruit. It was a whole different kind of movement. And you're right. And even they're finding this with the National Institute of Aging, that if you don't use your body the way it was supposed to be used, you start losing those functions. And and then you get into decline faster. And then, and then you know, you fall down and break your hip. But you can't correlate it back to lack of movement because it's five or ten years away from that event. Yeah. And I would say... You're so right. Like we need to play more. We need to have fun. It's not about just getting to the gym where you're in an artificial light environment and the off gassing of the rubber mats, you know, I mean, oh no, like we should just play more. And I think also be careful not to age mentally. In other words, I remember a friend of mine when we were going to turn 40 and he's like, oh, I'm so old. And I was like, what? Like, Yeah, you are if you think you are. And my father, God bless him, he's like 87 or 88, and he still thinks like he's 30-something. Like he plays tennis, he does pull-ups. Like he just, he's so strong because he doesn't let his mind tell him what to do. (laughs) Um, And I was playing tennis with my son recently, and, you know, obviously he's half my age. (laughs) And, um, And it's like, well, you know, I'm just happy if I can beat a, beat him at a, a set or two, um, or I guess a game or two, or I shouldn't exaggerate. Um, but the point is I'm, I'm out there and a friend of mine said, Oh, I'd be afraid I would stumble on something. And I was like, what? That absolutely never crossed my mind. So I would say if you're completely sedentary, listen to this podcast and you're just listening because you want to, you know, age well, you know, start slowly, of course, but you know, build up to taking more walks and don't just get your coffee from the, coffee shop right around the corner, go a couple blocks down. I'm sure there's another one, you know, take little, little steps to move in the right direction of getting more active. But if you're already active, then don't be afraid to up your game. Like I used to exercise three times a week, three or four times a week in a controlled group fitness situation because I was the teacher and that's great. But now I just do a couple, but the other days I'm active every day. And I think before that wasn't the case. So I walk my dog. So I do pull-ups in the park. You know, I'm always and switching it up as well. So I'd say switch it up and stay as active as possible because you just don't want to even mentally age yourself before it's time. Yeah, I love that you said that, Hilda. And just a couple of quick two points on that. Number one is you're so right. We've got to the mind is everything, you're probably going to live as old as you think you are. And so this is an exercise that Dan Sullivan does, and Dan Sullivan has a podcast with Joe Polish. But what he does with some of his folks and his in his mastermind is he says to them, hey, um, how long do you think you're going to you know, live? And people say, oh, maybe 85 or 90 or 70 or whatever the age is. And then he asks them, Bef- the day before you die or the year before you die, how, what is going to be your physical condition? How are you going to be mentally? How are you going to be relationship-wise? And they say, oh, I'm going to be great. I want to be great. And after say great, great, great and all of those things, he goes, 
well, if you're great the day before you die in all of those areas, do you think you're going to die at that point? They're like, no, we're not. And so he just, and then he says, okay, what's the real age? When do you think you're really going to die? And they say, 10 or 15 years out. So he says, well, in the first 15 minutes of meeting you, I've gotten you 15 more years of life because because it's so mental. And the other thing uh, that I at least do or I recommend people start doing is as you think you're getting older, just start getting younger friends that are 10 or 20 or 30 years younger than you and start hanging out with them a little bit. And just being around those people and seeing how they interact will get you into a different frame of mind and you'll start thinking differently. you start thinking younger. So that's another hack that folks can do that's super easy to do. Plus, you're hanging out, you're building relationships that improves the quality of your life anyway. Absolutely. I agree with that 110%. And actually, being in this podcasting space and being in the health and wellness space, I've made so many friends that are younger than me, and I'm just having mm-hmm. the time of my life with them because they're awesome. They're not afraid mm-hmm. of anything. They're just going for it. And I'm like, this is the best. Yeah, and just meeting you, Hilda, and being around you at the at the Paleo FX conference, uh, you could have easily been in your 30s. Like, you've got great energy. You are bouncing around, running around, walking fast, like... I would not imagine that you're in your 50s, by the way. So kudos <laughs> Thank to you. you. <laughs> um, all right. So all of that's great. Do you have any other secrets about looking younger? So we talked about sleep, movement, eating. We talked about getting out in the sun. Is there anything you do for the skin that's different? Well, okay. This is a secret. <laughs> mm-hmm. But now your whole oh, audience please tell will us. know. Um, yes. This is crazy but true. I don't wash my face. I I don't wash. I literally don't wash my face. Like I think I'll never forget. I went to this like makeup party thing one time. It was like Mary Kay or something like that. And they were like, okay, you need to wash your face and remove all the oils. And then you need to put on these creams. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Why are we removing oils only to replace them? And they were like, oh, no, no, because there's dirt. Well, maybe, maybe there is. But I was just like, you know what? I think my body or my face has natural oils that will help it, you know, hold together. (laughs) So actually, so I don't wash my face at the end of the day. I, I mean, of course, when I shower, my face gets wet. I'm not saying that, but I don't use soap and I, um, I will actually just kind of slather my face sometimes with coconut oil or um, maybe vitamin E oil. Like I just feel like the more natural, the better. It doesn't have to be complicated. And the other thing I do actually is I do drink up my fair share of broth. And I remember talking with someone about that one time and they said broth is a good detoxer and it does eliminate wrinkles. And I didn't believe her at the time, but now I think it must be true because again, um, I think it has um, collagen, right? Which helps the skin's elasticity. So I think we should all glow from the inside out. So, you know, eating the fats we've talked about, eating that seafood, taking in that broth can make us look good on the outside when we're taking in the good stuff. Agreed. Um, Thank you for sharing that secret of yours. The the bone broth is is critically important because, as you said, it's got collagen. And we've learned now that either drinking collagen or even taking collagen supplements can improve the quality of your skin. Just be aware of people trying to sell you creams on your skin that have collagen because collagen is a very heavy protein and it cannot penetrate the human skin. So for the listeners out there, that's a that's a tip. Now... Oh, I didn't know that one. That's good. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to Okinawa in a few weeks to go explore and learn wise traditions from some of those centenarians. So I'm excited. You are? That's amazing. Yeah. I'm going to Australia this September. Did I tell you? That is amazing. Yes, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to be making some presentations, doing some interviews, and also... Um, learning about the wise traditions that they have there. Absolutely. Meeting with some indigenous Aboriginal people. Well, I'd love to touch base and find out what you've learned in your travels. Where can our listeners find you online, Hilda? Well, I'm all over Instagram at Holistic Hilda, and they can also go to my website, holistichilda.com, and they can listen to the Wise Traditions podcast wherever they get their podcasts. Absolutely. Please go subscribe to the Wise Traditions podcast. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. I can vouch for it myself. Hilda, thank you so much for being on the show. That sounds great for us. Thank you so much for having me on today. 
You can find all the information we discussed in this episode and links to studies in the show notes at antiaginghacks.net. To make sure you get notified of new episodes, please subscribe to the podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at antiaginghacks and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash antiaginghacks. And now for the disclaimers. This podcast is for general information purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. Please seek the advice of your health professional for any health or medical conditions.